In some sense, uh, we're repeating history, um, you know, intentionally repeating history. Uh, the advantage we have today is that the first scouts don't have to die with arrows in their back and, and displace another indigenous species. The moon is a place, I don't think there's any tall blue people there, um, but it does have resources. And it's, you know, the, the International Space Station, for all its challenges, um, did a magnificent thing. It proved that we as a species can cooperate in space. And for the first time with the International Space Station as a destination, humanity conquered a frontier without conquering each other. And we, we can, I think, um, transcend, you know, our national, um, uh, uh, our national limitations here on Earth and expand what we've learned in the International Space Station experience, bring in the private sector in a true way and show that we can do it on the moon. And it's an untried, unproven territory, not just technically, but politically, um, psych psychologically, and legally. And we're breaking new ground. And I'm really excited about the conversations we've sparked about what you can, can't, and shouldn't do on the moon. You know, I was thinking about Christopher Columbus lately and looked into him. So, you know, this, this person who's painted mostly as a heroic figure in, in history, what was he really like as a person? What was the real deal back then? And if you look into it, he was a quack and he was wrong, you know? And, and he went to every court that he could get to try to convince them that his plan was right. And, you know, whether he actually knew or not that he was wrong, know is debatable, but 2,500 miles would only get him halfway to the Orient from all of the expertise and information they had at the time. Every learned group who looked at his plan said, he's going to die, right? It's at least twice that distance. But he convinced Isabella and Ferdinand, you know, he, he convinced the one court in Spain that he should try. What their motivations were for supporting him are questionable as well. You know, some, he took, you know, a lot of the riffraff out of the jails and took, and you know, and they expropriated a lot of the ships and you know, I don't think they expected him to come back, but he did, you know, and what, but the point is, um, his, his personal goals and that which he convinced others to buy into are almost moot today because he opened up a no, new world, you know, and not many people know that he actually didn't touch North America until the fourth try. I mean, he, he touched islands, but he actually didn't touch the Americas, right, until the fourth try. But that doesn't matter in history. It, so. We may be the Christopher Columbuses, you know, whether it's platinum on the moon that we think, maybe platinum is the spice, you know, that we really get the people to get excited about. It doesn't matter because when we get there, as long as we get there, a whole new world of opportunity that will, will open up that we just didn't know about. You know, my co-founder, Naveen Jain, says, you know, when, when people introduced the iPhone for the first time, nobody said, this will be perfect for shooting, shooting birds at pigs. You know, nobody said that, right? So you just don't know what's going to happen once you introduce a new platform for humanity. And I'm sure that with the moon, um, there, what we're certain about is that we don't know what the real business case will be, but we're certainly there, be, there will be one. Uh, so Naveen Jain, Barney Pell, and, and myself are the co-founders of, of Moon Express. I, I'm, I'm so privileged uh, to, to meet these gentlemen. Uh, you know, themselves, uh, both, each of them, uh, very successful internet entrepreneurs. Uh, Barney Powell had founded, after being uh, a NASA uh, uh, engineer and scientist for 10 years, here at NASA Ames actually, had uh, made the successful, unusual transition to a successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur, spent his time as a VC for a while, did a number of startups with other people and learned, learned the game, and then, then did his own startup called PowerSet and then exited uh, Microsoft, acquired P PowerSet a couple of years ago for something north of 100 million. And uh, so Barney, you know, knows the game in Silicon Valley and one of the most brilliant, enthusiastic people I've ever met. I met Barney and Naveen through the Singularity University. Um, and uh, we're all on the board together and uh, uh, we had uh, known each other for some time and they knew I was interested in the moon. And they're both brilliant strategists, they're both brilliant entrepreneurs. And I was struggling with what the business case might be. And uh, what he'd come to the table with was something that uh, they couldn't deal with. But what they brought was the Silicon Valley perspective on how a startup should work. And we modeled uh, the lunar aspirations around a Silicon Valley type of model. And with that, you know, a new perspective, uh, we were able, they came in as co-founders, became the lead funders. A uh, number of institutional funders have come in from Silicon Valley since then. And uh, we're just on the way, riding a wave of awesomeness right now. You know, we've recently, you know, for uh, almost a year, we were pretty stealth. Um, 
it wasn't really because we were trying to hide everything we were doing. It's just a matter of circumstance. We had our heads down working hard. We didn't have time really to engage, to tell people about what we wanted to do. Uh, we had a very short fuse to get the company up and running. Um, we had a mandate to be one of the chosen of NASA for the Innovative Lunar Demonstration Data Program, which is NASA's complement to the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, we felt that unless we were one of those chosen, it really wasn't going to make sense for us to be a contender. Um, so we had a lot of work to do right at the beginning. So we had our heads down. Uh, we managed to be one of the chosen uh, in the Innovative Lunar Demo ILDD program. Uh, we also, of the six that were chosen, were one of the three that were chosen for the first uh, delivery contract under that, uh, that program. So we're very happy about that. We announced ourselves as a contender in the Google Lunar X Prize last September. And since then, we've been working really hard. It's only recently that we've been able to sort of, you know, have a little, little bit behind us now that we can sort of engage publicly what we're doing. So last week, we had a gala launch, you know, of the company. It was our first official. We're really launched. We're really serious. And we had 100 or so friends and colleagues from Silicon Valley come up, come out to a gala that we held at the Computer History Museum just next door to NASA Ames here and had a wonderful time. Um, and uh, you know, the media was wonderful to us. We've had a lot of play on the media. I think uh, New Space hasn't had a pulse in the media as broad as that uh, since perhaps the flight of Spaceship One. So we're very happy we hit the front page in the New York Times nationally. And uh, we're really happy that it wasn't just about Moon Express. We're happy that it was about Moon Express, but we're happy we brought the Google and our X Prize along with us and a lot of the contenders that are trying so hard like we are. Uh, so I think it was a good moment for us that we said, you know, this is the 42nd anniversary last week of Apollo 11. It was also the day, July 21st, we picked for our gala launch party, which was the landing of the space shuttle and really the conclusion of the space shuttle program. We had a number of astro shuttle astronauts in the audience at the gala with us, and we were able to say, thanks, guys. You know, absolutely, this is uh, both an honor of the past and this is a celebration of the future. And we're trying to provide a counterpoint to a lot of the doom and gloom that the media was talking about, the end of the program, the end of the era. The only thing it was the end of was the end of the beginning. And so we wanted to shout out to the world, this is just the beginning. And, you know, together with the governments, uh, we, the private sector, are excited about the future. And this gives us a chance. You know, the pterodactyls, you know, there was the last flight of the pterodactyl as well at one point, you know. They, they had their time, right? Now we have our time and we're going to transition. So it was that coming out party. You know, we're now able to talk about what we're doing. We're sitting here at the NASA Research Park, you know, part of the NASA Ames facility. Uh, right in proximity to he us here is what we call Area 45, a building, uh, two-story building, where we have our hover test facility. It was developed originally by NASA, and we, Moon Express, have taken it over as a commercial venue to, for testing our lunar technology, and we have our uh, lunar test vehicle uh, flying in a net uh, in that facility. Uh, testing some of our lunar technology we're developing, we're developing a radar system, we're developing new uh, leg landing technology, and it's all about, you know, the last 10 feet. You know, we can buy everything we want, we can go to SpaceX and we can get off the planet very economically, we can go to ATK and we get engines that get us to the moon. You can buy everything you need to get to the moon, what you can't buy is the thing that slows you down, <laughs> the lander. So Moon Express is about the landing technology, and it's about the la it's the only the last ten feet that matters. You know the, it's and that's the thing that nobody has on the planet right now. That's why the only missions back to the moon right now are going around. They're not going down to the surface because even though this was done forty or fifty years ago, all that technology is in museums. The people who did it are elders or sadly have gone. So we really are uh, not reinventing, but we're able to with a partnership with NASA with something called a Reimbursable Space Act Agreement. We are able to hire NASA, in effect, and pay NASA f uh, to harvest a lot of the knowledge that they have gained, to reimburse them for assisting us technically. And uh, by that, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can take the best of what NASA's done, combine it with best industry practices, uh, invoke commercial management, and the risk, uh, the risk tolerances that we have that are far greater than any government program that can have, and do what we believe is a very economical program to build a lander system that is not just economical for one mission, but it's economical for many missions, right? And, and we don't have to throw it away at the end of the mission because we'll use it again.